Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and this talk is going to be on the detection of pancreatic cancer, potential pearls and pitfalls in daily practice. Now, in this talk, I'm not really going to speak about the small tumors we miss. Uh, this article we published and uh, refers to an article by Yoon that showed that in about 70-ish percent of cases, over 70% of the time, a pancreatic cancer was missed on a study done before it was finally diagnosed. We know that survival is dependent on early diagnosis. So you can imagine how many patients we can save potentially if we can detect things earlier. So it's very important to recognize that tumors that are typically missed are those under two centimeters. Sometimes things are missed when you don't see the tumor, it's iso intense, but you see a dilated duct and you don't pay attention to the duct. I'll show just a couple of cases of pitfalls, but then what I'm really gonna focus on in this talk is looking very carefully at things that look like pancreatic cancer that can be confused with pancreatic cancer, things that not uncommonly show up at our multidisciplinary conferences. Now, if you look at this case, this is the classic example of a lesion that's commonly missed. There's a low density lesion in the one to two centimeter range in the uncinate process. When you concentrate in the uncinate process, you see how it's rounded and there's a subtle lesion present. It's also nicely shown when I do the 3D imaging, you can see the low density becomes much more obvious even on the uh, coronal, uh, just routine coronal, you don't see it. Again, here, when I get just the right image, it becomes super obvious, but this was a cancer that was missed initially. Again, the importance, I would tell you, of looking at multiplanar, looking very carefully, narrowing the windows, looking at the areas where things are missed. Uncinate is one of them, tail of the pancreas is another. When you have small lesions that don't cause duct dilatation, they're easy to miss, and they don't distort the boundaries as we typically think about things in the head or the body or proximal tail of the pancreas. Or this case, here's a lesion where there's a dilated pancreatic duct, but you, unless you look really hard, you don't appreciate this one centimeter mass right here, but you do see the dilated pancreatic duct. Now, when you see a dilated pancreatic duct and there's a cutoff, you have to assume there's a malignancy present. Occasionally, it's a neuroendocrine tumor. Occasionally, it's a stricture. But with abrupt cutoff like this, to me, it means it's pancreatic adenocarcinoma till proven otherwise. Here it is on the coronal view. You just don't see the mass well. And again, here's some venous phase imaging. Perhaps you see it a little bit better on the venous. There's the most subtle changes in texture. But again, it's subtle, even on the coronal view. But when you go to cinematic rendering, and I'll start with this image, which shows you the obvious duct cutoff, you know there has to be something right there. And then you go a little bit further, that's the area. And as you change the texture mapping, you realize you're looking at a significant change in texture, best seen right here. And here's an obvious one centimeter pancreatic cancer, obstructing the pancreatic duct adenocarcinoma. When you diagnose things at this stage, the chance of the patient's survival with a um, Whipple's procedure is indeed going to be much higher. So again, picking up small tumors is what we need to do. Anybody can see a five centimeter mass. It's typically too late at that time. We gotta pick up that 72% of lesions that are there that we just are missing. So again, whether you're using multiplanar, whether you're using cinematic rendering with texture mapping, all of this becomes very important. And looking at pancreatic lesions is no different than most of radiology. This article speaks about how there's a 30% error rate when there's a pathology present, and about half of those errors are simply missing the finding that's on the study. Now, in terms of pitfalls, a pancreatic mass can occur in any part of the gland. And it's mostly in the uncinate lower head and tail where things are missed when they're very subtle. Most patients have a single site of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Occasionally you have multiple pancreatic lesions. It may be a patient with multiple IPMNs and one of them has become malignant and there's a solid component. But typically we're looking at a solitary lesion. Now some pitfalls. Pancreatic mass that can look similar to a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, 
sometimes hypovascular neuroendocrine tumors and acinar cell tumors, which are typically more cystic. Pancreatitis can simulate pancreatic cancer, and that's particularly true with autoimmune pancreatitis. Things that are in the duodenum, gist tumors, carcinoid tumors, especially when you don't have arterial phase imaging, adenocarcinoma of the uh, duodenum, ampullary tumors are all possibilities. And then, of course, things that are peripancreatic, like lymphoma or metastatic adenopathy, say from colon cancer, can at times make you consider that you're dealing with pancreatic cancer. And all of these will show up at our multidisciplinary conference. Now, when I think about things that help me prevent errors in diagnosis and help me really make early detection of pancreatic cancer or also distinguish pancreatic cancer from what I would call lookalikes, is the pancreatic duct, is it dilated, and is there a transition? What about the common duct? Is there a stone in the duct? Is there a bruck cutoff? Is it a common duct lesion or an ampullary lesion or a pancreatic head lesion? What about the key vessels? The key vessels are obviously part of staging, but if you see the vessels are effaced, then you know you're dealing with a tumor and you're always thinking about adenocarcinoma. And this is true on the arterial side, SMA or celiac or hepatic artery or splenic or GDA, as well as portal vein and SMV typically. And then of course, changes in texture or changes in density, whether it's increased, typically hypervascular like neuroendocrine, or it's decreased like adenocarcinoma, or it's isodense. And remember, people say perhaps 5% of pancreatic adenocarcinomas are isodense, but the reality is in those isodense tumors, there typically is pancreatic duct dilatation. So let's just look a little bit at the dilated common duct for a second. And yes, we think about dilated common ducts with pancreatic cancer, but as I mentioned, it can be ampullary cancer. If the cutoff is high or up, particularly if the duct is enhancing, it could be a common bile duct primary tumor like a cholangiocarcinoma. And at times, things like stones in the distal duct can fool you. This was a patient who presented with jaundice. It was an older patient. So they assumed it was a poorly defined pancreatic cancer. When you look at the images, you see a dilated gallbladder, dilated intrahepatic ducts. But when you look carefully, there's a circular structure in the very distal common duct. And then you look at it and it's sitting right in the distal common duct. And this is a stone in the distal common duct. Very nicely shown. Big intrahepatic ducts, big common duct, even some enhancement which occurs with inflammation. And there's the impacted stone. So impacted stones are more common in older patients, is more common in patients with distended gallbladder and with gallstones. But it's easy to miss, particularly if the stone is not calcified or minimally calcified, then it can be confused with an ampullary lesion or a distal common duct lesion or a pancreatic cancer. So just very nicely shown in this example. Here it is on the cinematic rendering. You see the ring of the stone in the distal duct, really nicely shown. Here it is again. And the rest of the pancreatic gland, as you can see from the texture mapping, looks fine, but beautiful demonstration of a stone in the distal common duct. Now I mentioned in one of the first cases I showed you the importance of pancreatic duct cutoff. So when I see pancreatic duct cutoff, I'm always thinking about adenocarcinoma, but it's not the only thing that causes duct cutoff. Neuroendocrine tumors, particularly small neuroendocrine tumors, often when they're inside the duct, they cause serotonin and you get a response with stenosis of the duct. You can have chronic pancreatitis, but then of course it's very common to see glandular calcifications as well. You can have an inflammatory stricture, but again, we always think about pancreatic cancer and you need to make certain you're not missing pancreatic cancer. Here's a good example of a markedly dilated pancreatic duct with abrupt cutoff of the duct. And you can tell exactly where the duct is cut off and you don't see anything enhancing on these images. And you would say, aha, I must be dealing with an isodense pancreatic cancer. You also could say, well, maybe I'm dealing with a main duct IPMN, but if this was a main duct IPMN, it would surely have undergone malignant change with that mass in the pancreas. And you could see it again, the textural changes on the cinematic. Now, this is kind of interesting. I would go with adenocarcinoma here, but it was a neuroendocrine tumor. So just to remind you that not every neuroendocrine tumor is hypervascular. 
Now, when we talk about pancreatic masses, it's also important for me to mention that in lesion detection, not every pancreatic mass is adenocarcinoma. And the truth is not everyone is malignant. On the malignant side, we think about neuroendocrine tumors. We also think about metastasis, like from renal cell, which are hypervascular and look like neuroendocrine tumors. We talk about cystic pancreatic lesions, simple IPMNs, four to 10 or 15% of the population will have them. We talk about other cystic lesions from serous cyst adenomas, which have multiple septations, though they have a range of appearances, we'll cover some of them. We talk about mucinous cystic neoplasms. We talk about SPEN tumors. Then we talk about lymphopathelial cysts. So there are a range of pancreatic masses, not all of them are pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Now here's a case that's just amazing. Here, body of pancreas is a low density lesion. This is arterial phase. And for me, this is pancreatic cancer. And I was pleased because it's about a centimeter and a half and it should be resectable. Interestingly, on venous phase, the lesion is essentially isodense. Maybe there's a small cystic component right here. So I'm thinking that's really weird. And maybe there's some increased enhancement. So now I'm thinking this must be a neuroendocrine tumor with some mild vascularity on the later phase imaging. Adenocarcinoma has become more hypodense, not less. Well, this patient had a distal pancreatectomy and the surgeon felt something palpable there. This ended up being, and here it is on the cinematic, obviously must be a cancer. There it is, hypodense, again. And here it is kind of becoming more isodense, but still seen with a bit of higher density and some cystic component. Very interesting case. This was gonna be resected. I don't think anyone would have the nerve to just biopsy it and leave it alone. But this came back as a um, benign IPMN, okay? In a patient with chronic pancreatitis. So, wow, patient was lucky. Or this case, again, a low density lesion, similar location, body of pancreas. To me, it looks low density. It kind of fills in a little bit, but there's still mass effect. There's a mass here. There's no doubt about it. You're still thinking pancreatic adenocarcinoma, though it's not behaving like a classic pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and it was a serous cyst adenoma. Again, very unusual. Serous cyst adenomas, we talk about cystic with septations, often with calcification, but there's a spectrum of appearances. Remember, serous cyst adenomas can be very vascular, can look like neuroendocrine tumors. This is a most unusual diagnosis. Here it is nicely shown on the cinematic rendering. Again, very nicely shown, but kind of tricky. Now, of course, serous cyst adenomas, this is what we think about, large lesions with what looks like a um, honeycomb type appearance, very nicely shown, a large serous cyst adenoma. Serous cyst adenomas are typically vascular, can stretch the vessels, as you can see here, how it pulls the hepatic artery and GDA around it. There's prominent vascularity in the lesion. Serous cyst adenomas do have some features that can make them confused with malignancies. But again, typically you'll see this nice appearance. Serous cyst adenomas, particularly when they're large, can be relatively invasive, though not malignant. They can involve the portal vein and the SMV. We typically used to say they don't obstruct the pancreatic duct, but in this case, and in others, both large and small, they can obstruct the patient's pancreatic duct. Here's a cystic neuroendocrine tumor. Hypervascular lesion, remember, neuroendocrine tumors typically are very vascular in their entirety, but you can see cystic neuroendocrine tumors, and this is a wonderful example. Neuroendocrine tumors, although large, often don't obstruct the common duct or pancreatic duct, and it's their vascularity that allows you to separate them from adenocarcinoma. At times, there can be confusion with a serous cyst adenoma, and this might be such a case, but the stretching of vessel here was really good, but again, it can be some difficulty in the diagnosis. Just a beautiful example of a complex lesion with cystic and solid components and increased vascularity. We never used to think about neuroendocrine tumors as being cystic, but both small and large neuroendocrine tumors can be cystic as nicely shown in this example. Now, in terms of other things that can confuse us, metastasis to the pancreas. The most common med is renal cell carcinoma, usually occurring about a decade after initial diagnosis. And the way you make the diagnosis typically is you see a missing kidney 
and you see a vascular lesion or several vascular lesions that look very much like neuroendocrine tumors and it's metastatic renal cell carcinoma. There are a range of things that can go to pancreas. Some strange tumors, this was a uterine Leiomyer sarcoma metastatic to the pancreas. Solid mass, there's some neovascularity. You no doubt would have thought of this as a primary malignancy, though it just didn't look like an adenocarcinoma. Here it is on the cinematic rendering. Now, we can also see masses that arise near the pancreatic head, which can be confusing. It's not uncommon for us to see lesions referred in for pancreatic cancer that aren't. Now, at times the biopsy was pending, or the biopsy was indeterminate, or it came back adenocarcinoma. But here are some examples of things that can be confusing. Now, paragangliomas, it's an extra adrenal field, chromocytoma basically, they occur often near the adrenal, but they can simulate, as in this case, a neuroendocrine tumor of the head of the pancreas. What you can see that makes you, the diagnosis is that the pancreas is displaced. This is not coming from the pancreas, it's near the pancreas. But you can see why it's a very difficult diagnosis. It's not uncommon for us to see paragangliomas in this location. Look at the vascularity of that lesion. Indeed, very impressive. Here's another case. Now, I have to admit, this is a big pancreatic mass, but it doesn't really look like an adenocarcinoma. It's well-defined and large, homogeneous. And you could think at first, maybe it's extra pancreas pushing on the pancreas like a gist tumor. That would be a thought. But then you really don't see the pancreatic head. And this was coming from the pancreatic head. And this was the most unusual diagnosis of a schwannoma. Schwannomas can be large, arising within the pancreatic gland, simulating a hypovascular neuroendocrine tumor, even at times when it's small, simulating an adenocarcinoma. Here you can see nicely that the vessels, including GDA, were simply displaced. And here it is on the venous phase, very well defined. Now I have to admit, I have not seen very many of these lesions, but again, it does make the point that if I saw this lesion, I would go through a differential diagnosis, including a neuroendocrine tumor, as I mentioned, but I would say this does not look like an adenocarcinoma. And here it is again. So there's certain lesions, and again, this one does have a dilated pancreatic duct, I also showed this case and this extra set of images to make the point that pancreatic duct dilatation occurs in adenocarcinoma. It occurs with strictures. It occurs with neuroendocrine tumors, particularly when they involve the duct and they arise in the duct. They can be seen in serous cyst adenomas and other tumors like um, neurogenic tumors, for example. And again, look how smooth this lesion is. And we think about things that are low density. So schwannoma is a good diagnosis. And here's just a few more images showing that. Now, it's interesting. We have had several more cases like this. Most of them are in the body of the pancreas, but they always are a very difficult diagnosis. And it's only after surgery that you really know you were right. Now, sometimes things just don't look right. I looked at this case, and it looks like a mass arising from the tail of the pancreas. Again, doesn't typically look like a uh, adenocarcinoma. I thought maybe it's a neuroendocrine tumor, maybe it's a spend tumor based on the patient's age, but I'm sure it's a pancreatic mass. So is the surgeon, and you could see it there. Again, maybe some calcification, a little bit of enhancement. You worry about malignancy. Again, there's a range of possibilities what this could be. But I tell you, I was most surprised when this came back, primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. Unbelievable. Now, when we also think about things around the pancreas, things that simulate pancreatic masses, we also need to think about things in the duodenum. And really, three possibilities that come to mind, adenocarcinoma, a gist tumor, and carcinoid tumors. So let's do this. Let's stop right here. Let's take a five minute break and let's come right back. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CT Is Us YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctsus.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.